you're much more happier when you understand uh, the word enough. And that's so, so hard uh, for so many people because what happens is once they get to one level of success, it becomes a comparison with the people they hang out with. And it's always this upper, I have to beat them out. So-and-so just bought a new Tesla. I need that new Tesla, et cetera, et cetera. I have to say, uh, listen, I was not immune to that. And I'll tell you an interesting story with my first book. Well, I was convinced to do it by a person who would, who had attended some of my lectures, which that's an interesting story in itself. But I did the book and of course there was some publicity and stuff, but I really never looked at sales at all. It just was irrelevant. <laughs> my statement was, uh, if this book can help one person that's fine. I, that's, uh, I'm happy. I, I have gratitude for that. Then with this second book, you know, it, it seemed to uh, resonate with a lot of people. And my publicist, who the publishing house uh, hired, you know, they said, oh, Jim, you know, your book is now beating the, you know, top 1000 books on Amazon. Because, you know, when it was first posted on Amazon, it was before it was published. It was like 400,000 or something like that. They go, it's about to break 1,000. And then you need to check it. It's about to do this. And then I realized now I'm looking at the Amazon <laughs> thing and I'm going, what is wrong with me? I, I just... <laughs> and again, uh, it shows you how easily you can get into that, uh, this type of comparison. And uh, it's also amusing because uh, I have all these people who text me or send me these notes on social media going, you know, we can bring you up by 100x if you just paid blah, 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 blah blah, blah. And, you know, and you could say I'm the stupidest person in the world because I just don't even understand it. Yes, it would be great if people, if my message resonated with people and people appreciated uh, me pontificating. <laughs> but uh, that's not what I'm chasing after. Again, if my actions can benefit one person, 10 people, a thousand people, that's great. And, you know, this is part of the problem, too, is this comparison thing. People sit there and I've heard them say, well, I've done nothing in my life. And then you look at it, you go, well, look, you know, you cared for your family. You raised children, good children. They're leading productive lives. That in and of itself is a huge, huge win for you. You don't have to do anything else. And, you know, and it's so sad because people get into this thing like, well, you know, I should have done something where I got all this recognition. The recognition you get, first of all, it has to come from yourself. But it's not on the scale that sometimes we think it needs to be. I mean, nothing is more beautiful than if you find a partner and you raise wonderful children or you do the best you can and, and life's not perfect, but you've done the best you can. The other thing that people get lost in, you know, they'll sit there and say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not in a position to do anything. Well, you're in a position to simply sometimes say hello to people. Somebody saying hello, somebody taking a minute, somebody buying somebody a meal, somebody helping somebody change a tire. These types of actions, which you can do every day and which cost you nothing, can not only have a profound effect on the other person, they have a profound effect on you. And that is the life we should all try to uh, uh, aspire to. I mean, I think back to situations where I desperately needed or wanted something. What happens with that, of course, is as you keep trying to make it happen, you get more anxious, more afraid. You know, the, cl the sun is obstructed by dark clouds. Uh, you, you say, I don't believe in God anymore. There's nobody there. Nobody loves me. And then when that person makes that effort and saves you <laughs> at the last minute, it is <laughs> profound, right? Suddenly the clouds part, the sun is shining. God has reached out to you. You believe in the goodness in the world. And having been in that position on more than one occasion, I certainly appreciate it. But also being able to give that gift to people is an extraordinary opportunity and is so life affirming and so fulfilling. Yeah, I resonate there deeply because one of my specialties is suicide prevention. As a veteran myself, and as um, my background is also in psychedelic science, funny you brought that up. The, <laughs> we could have several conversations. I know, synchronicity is out of control, but uh, one of the biggest contributing factors to individuals who successfully 
commit suicide is because no one checked in at last minute saying, hey, are you okay? Hey, are you thinking about suicide? Hey, are you thinking about taking your own life? This seemingly minute, small, tiny action could have profound impact, like you said. And like you talked about, science is clear. Gratitude is the number one contributing factor to happiness, like we talked about earlier. And one way to feel gratitude is through servant leadership, which is what I practice at church. And so I really hope that people can take away the bread and butter of this conversation. Just from what we said, it's just do one nice thing a day. And that compounds to 365% of kindness that you can do every single year. On that token, I do want to go in, going back to some of the crux and the science of your book and really keep uh, going down this comment because there's so many questions I still want to ask. One of the thing we talked about earlier is the subconscious, right? We only know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. And outside of what we know is everything we don't know, right? One of the most visual metaphor that Matthew shared with me is because I asked him, how come the best people I interact with are so also the most humble people? He laughed, similar to a contagious laugh, right? In his French accent. And he says, well, think, <laughs> <laughs> think about a fruit, a fruit tree, fruit trees that bear many fruits, the leaves and the branches are dangling down, like bowing down. And the fruit trees that are bearless and has no fruit are standing up high. This is the reason why humility is important. Um, but going back to what we don't know, I learned this from your book and it blew my mind. Uh, our brains are bombarded with between six to 10 million bits of information per second, while we can only cognitively process 50 bits of information or about 0.0005% of what's coming through our consciousness. Aside from numbers and you're like, wow, our consciousness is really nothing, huh? Like, what does it mean practically for us? You mentioned consciousness and uh, and there's a the subconscious and we have some access to that. Then there's the unconscious, which for most of us, we do not have access to. And this is where most of that qualia or information comes from our sensory organs. And that information is used to maintain the homeostasis of our bodily functions. That being said, though, the interesting thing about the subconscious, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is in some ways it is always on. And as I also said, all of us uh, are manifesting already. The reality is it's like an athlete. Athletes become elite athletes when they train. And typically they don't do that uh, by themselves. They do it based on working with or having knowledge of or reading about people who have great expertise and help outline a strategy for them to maximize their ability to excel at whatever athletic endeavor. And so the first thing is, one, to understand what you're manifesting already, which we've already spoken about. I mean, I'm sure you've met people in your practice who say, I don't understand it. I'm going through my third divorce and I've married the exact same person all three times and they're abusive and alcoholics. And, 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 <laughs> and uh, you know, the, the, the problem is people are carrying this baggage forward that impacts every decision they make, every interaction they have and every choice they make. And so, first of all, you have to stop and reflect on what you're already manifesting. And again, as you know, the baggage we carry is a result of habits that we have created for good and for bad. The other thing, which we've already discussed a bit, is understanding the difference between what you think you want and what you actually need, what is best for you. And in fact, sometimes I've had people say to me, they go, well, you know, I tried to manifest this, but it didn't happen. But retrospectively, I'm glad it didn't happen because that wouldn't <laughs> have been a good choice for me. Right. And so on some levels, your subconscious has knowledge, which you don't have about yourself. But getting back to this training, if you've never been taught how to run a race, you're not going to run the race very well. And oftentimes when we try to pick up a new habit, one of the first things we have to do uh, and the best way to instill a habit is to do baby steps. Whether you want to read, uh, what is it, uh, Atomic Habits or uh, what's the other one by B.J. Fogg. But one is to start slow. And you, on a subconscious level, you understand then how to change your brain. There's a saying that what uh, fires together wires together. 
Mm. And this is why uh, if you look at manifestation, that is why there's repetition. And you use all your sensory organs. We talked about, you were saying all this information comes in. Well, if we use all of our sensory organs, we write, we think about it, we write it down, we read it silently, we read it aloud, we sit and think and this, have this imagery of it happening. We're engaging pretty much all of our sensory organs to embed that into our subconscious. And then that's where the magic really happens. As you are aware, there are different cognitive brain networks. One of them is our default mode network. And while we may not appreciate it, that is activated when our mind wanders or when we're daydreaming. It's very self-referential. It paints the narrative of who we see ourselves as or want to be. And then it turns its, that information over to what we call our salience network. It then defines what is salient, what should we put our attention focused on. And that then activates our attention network, which has sort of laser guidance to make things happen. And the salience network uh, on the subconscious level is always on. I use the example, I think of a, a bloodhound always searching for how to make something happen. And then I'm trying to remember the phrase I used, uh, what the subconscious uh, desires, the conscious finds. Uh, finds. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of my quote. <laughs> and that's the way it works. And when I say the conscious, this is uh, our executive control network, then acts as the finder or the organizer of or makes it happen. And I'm sure you have been to a party where it's very loud. Yet in the den of all of this, if your voice is said, you will turn to it because that is a deeply embedded identifier of who you are. So you're always attuned to that. And I use the example, and I, I'm sure my example relates, let's say, to neurosurgery, where I say to somebody, well, listen, you have a benign brain tumor. It's called a meningioma. And the person will say, I have never heard of that term before. Then I'll see them six or eight weeks later and go, that's the most amazing thing. I've run into five <laughs> people with the exact same thing, right? Because they have made that salient in some ways out of anxiety and fear, okay? Also, we'll tell you another example that's happened over the last few months. I was at a coffee shop. I've been working on a, a fairly esoteric project. Again, complete noise, can hardly hear anything yet. I heard a couple of terms related to the project I'm working on by two individuals in the corner. I walked over, identified myself, got to know them, and now we're working together on this project. Mm. That is the peak of manifestation, right? I embedded that intention. I let my mind wander in a default node network to find it more. It then went to the salience network and uh, defined what I needed to attend. And then uh, not on a conscious level, on a uh, subconscious level, was always a looking around for that possibility. This is where the term synchronicity or coincidence comes from. It's from these types of things. And the, th the most important point though is you can manifest even when you're stressed and anxious, which is what I did as a child, but the best way to manifest is if you've engaged your parasympathetic nervous system, where one, these brain networks function at their best, your physiology functions at its best, and you have the right mental attitude. The other thing just to emphasize is you have to understand that you are the person who limits your beliefs and possibilities. Hmm. And once you unleash that, you have unlimited possibilities. Now, this isn't to say that you say to yourself, I want to land on Mars next week. That will not happen. Okay. But if it's in the reasonable context of possibilities, even though it may seem a very, very low likelihood, that certainly can happen. <laughs> 